The great Molly Bolin Kazmer is here. We're going to be talking about what just happened in the WNBA, the secret prehistory that you need to know more about with professional women's basketball, and I'm sure other things as well. Locked on Women's Basketball starts now. You are Locked on Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Well, happy Tuesday to you and welcome to Locked On Women's Basketball. I'm your host, Howard McDowell, reminding you that you can listen to us every day wherever you find your podcast. Go ahead and subscribe on YouTube or any other podcast service. Women's basketball, past, present, and future, every single weekday. Plus, we have a new WNBA draft podcast that goes out on Saturday. So we got you covered. I, I am very excited about the upcoming college basketball season. We're going to have a ton of guests come be part of that as well. And of course, our staff over at the Next will be there covering it 24 7, 365. Go to thenextsoups.com. Make sure you subscribe to everything that we're doing there. $9 a month, $72 a year funds all of this work. And of course, a critical part of what we are doing at The Next, and we've started here in 2022, but we're going to continue it on, is telling stories about the WBL. And so Molly Bolin-Kazmer, who is a legend of the WBL, is here. But I think it's important. This is I'm going to describe this as the second in a, so, a series of conversations. Because Molly and I, we have a lot to talk about. Um, I have had the honor of being able to correspond with you during the WNBA playoffs as I was covering that as well. But there's this, I think, a breaking up of the history of professional women's basketball. That we tend to think of it in segments instead of a flow that comes mm -hmm. from the WBL, you know, right through to the present day. And so the place I just want to start there is WBL runs through 1981. WNBA begins in 1997. But this was not some sort of fallow period of time. This is a period of time where stars like you needed to find different ways to play. And so can you just take me through even that period of a few years? Because, you know, our conversation about your jump shot is the one that keeps staying with me. I keep coming back to about that period right after the WBL folds. Hi, Howard. First of all, thanks for having me back. Um, it's always fun to talk uh, women's basketball history. Um, I would basically start with saying that if you connect the dots from the WNBA of today, going back through the history to the very beginning with the WBL, you can see that there's an influence that uh, prevailed even after the WBL. A lot of the players went into coaching and had uh, direct influences on a lot of the players today who in turn coached some of the WNBA stars of today. So there is a connection between the past and the present. And that's been part of the fun that we've had at LOB, Legends of the Ball, Inc., is to connect that history, the past and the present, and show the path that we took to, uh, to create what it is to help pave the way for what it is today. When you think about that time, you know, in that period following the end of WBL and heading into, you know, a, a period of unknown, what is striking to me is how consistent, how active you are in trying to build other leads that followed. And so take me, though, to that moment. I, a thing that I find um is a recurring issue within women's sports is when men's sports has a team that doesn't do well or a league that folds, it's treated as a one-off. And when it happens in women's sports, it's treated collectively. It's a collective uh, failure by those who are critical of women's sports in general. How much do you think that colored the battle that followed and why it took uh, well over a decade um, to try and establish permanently, and I, I think we both believe the WNBA is here to stay, but permanently a women's professional basketball league here in America. Well, if you go back to the beginnings, 
we obviously believed in it. We saw the growth of with Title IX, the growth of women's uh, college basketball and how it, you know, the, the, uh, the talent needed a place to grow. So that's how the WBL was created with the explosion of growth of uh, women's basketball after Title IX. Then it became a really a big challenge of where do we go from here because there wasn't that continuation. Uh, the European leagues were, were going on at the same time as well. So they yeah. had started the growth about the same time as we had here in the United States. But we always believed that there was a future for women's pro basketball. I personally was involved in five different attempts at women's pro basketball. I played in three. I played in the WBL, the LPBA, uh, which only lasted one season, and the WABA, which only lasted one season. But if you look at it, like you said, collectively, you see that each attempt and each effort that we put into it built the blocks to where we are. It wasn't like it just fell out. Even though for many, many years, people had no clue that it even existed because with the WBL, we, with the excess that we did have, it was more localized in, even though we had major cities like Chicago, New York, and LA, San Francisco, but people outside the markets of the WBL really didn't know we existed because we didn't have the social media and we didn't have the internet and all the ways that reach women's basketball fans today uh, didn't exist back you know, in the late seventies and early eighties. So we really, and then, and then corporate sponsorship, television money, all of that had to come full circle. Mm -hmm. And just about the time that WBL was starting is right about the time ESPN was beginning as well. So there, there could have been that great opportunity there had we made it that far. It's something that I think about often. I think about the period of time where ESPN could have flipped a switch in a lot of ways and been the key, been the portal to women's professional basketball the way it was for college basketball, the way it made, for instance, Big East men's basketball a household right. name as I'm growing up in the 1980s and 90s. And so, you know, there is that, but there's also the fact that you're talking about, you know, these local, and it's sort of the flip side of, uh, you know, something being treated as a collective downfall is each individual success, it feels like is always treated as a one-off, right? You know, well, sure, it succeeded here, but, and, and, and it takes me back, honestly, the parallels when I read WBL history and, and the leagues that followed, right? To, I, it wasn't that long ago that when the U.S. women's national team in soccer had a huge audience, I had people tell me with a straight face, powerful people say, well, sure, they want to watch the national team, but there's not going to be an appetite for women's club soccer. And it just, it always sounded like the craziest thing to me, right? They're the same players, you know, oh, they're going to 25,000 are going to show up at Red Bull Arena for Megan Rapino, but they're not going to show up in Seattle. Of course they are. Of course, it's the same audience. Mm -hmm who wants the same players, it's just a fundamentally different uniform. And for me, that's what it feels like. The national team in the 1980s had more of a foothold in women's basketball. You had European, you had overseas lead that had more of a foothold. But here in the United States, there was still that push. There was still that struggle. You even had, as the NCAA gobbled up AIAW, and you had the NCAA women's basketball tournament begin in earnest. Did right. you feel as if you were having the same conversation again and again, trying to have this proof of concept as you were doing this? No question about it. I did different, a lot of different interviews, press conferences, asked the same questions over a 10, 12 year period during that dead period, that dead zone between the first pro league and before the WNBA came along in 1996. But the, the thing we're we're talking about here and the difference is at the beginning when we were there we had we had social and historical impact because we were breaking new ground for women in athletics or women overall because it really wasn't that acceptable they the society in general looked at women's sports as golf and tennis is okay but anything else is just too manly and so we had to break down that barrier of look, you know, we, we, we do deserve to have other opportunities and basketball was the obvious one because of the, the growth in the sport. But going back to the ESPN opportunities, 
when it first started, they were more interested in the major college programs, which makes sense. And um, I remember Ann Myers Drysdale was uh, there starting to do her broadcasting right at the beginning of the ESPN games. And so there were so few opportunities at that time for these televised games. And of course they wanted uh, someone that had the success of basketball and the recognition that she had. She did a great job yeah. starting out. So she's got this long storied history and in, in broadcasting as well, that goes all the way back to those early days. There is a version of events, a better version of events, a more just version of events, where the WBL is on ESPN right from the beginning, and Annie becomes a voice mm -hmm. of the WBL in that same way. I, I it keeps me up nights. I can only imagine uh, for you as well. Um, I need to talk about your jump shot and why every time I watch Chelsea Gray, I was thinking about it throughout covering the WNBA finals. Uh, but first, I want to talk to our audience about Built Bar. Uh, and if you haven't tried Built Bar Puffs yet, why you need to enjoy the cookie dough chunk puffs. Um, my voice is a little scratchy as I am in my first day back from a Disney World trek with my family. And uh, I can tell you that walking all over Epcot, walking all over Magic Kingdom, what helped power us, what helped got us through, uh, what allowed me to survive the trip uh, was Built Bar Cookie Dough Chun Puffs for all of them as well. It's covered in 100% real chocolate with 15 grams of protein, but only 160 calories. So no, we did not live on Mickey Mouse uh, ear chocolate ice cream bars alone. We were able to get through and uh, see that um, maybe it's a small world after all, but it didn't feel that way as we were walking around. So go to Built.com and use promo code LOCKEDON15 and get 15% off your order. That is promo code Locked on 15, as always, tell them Grandma Myrna sent you. So, Molly, I'm watching Dewana Bonner on Chelsea Gray in the finals. Kerr Miller decides to put some length on her. And so she had to find a way to get her shot off. She was getting her shot off, though. It didn't matter who was guarding her. Are you identifying with Chelsea Gray and her shot in that moment because, and we talked about this off air, I was watching video of you from 1984. It was a one-on-one -on -one against Nancy Lieberman. And it didn't matter whether Nancy was guarding you. It didn't matter who was guarding you in those games. You were getting your shot off, but you were kind of moving back a little. You had changed your shot. And you told me it was because you had to play against men for several years as you were trying to get another lead started. So just Take me through that process of watching and identifying, if you can. Oh, absolutely. I did identify with Chelsea Gray because it's called, it's just creating a shot. Mm -hmm. But being way ahead of our time, it goes back to when I was in high school back in Iowa, when we played the three on three half court game. And it was all about one on one, basically creating a shot off a dribble. Mm -hmm. So that's what I learned in the very beginning with the basic fundamentals is to elevate on jump shot and create that space from the defense and elevate over the defense. Can you explain that to our audience real quick, just sort of what the fundamentals of those games you were playing were like, what were the rules, how they differed? Um, because it's fascinating to me and obviously it dovetails directly into the type of player you became. Oh, no question about it. I mean, six on six basketball, even though a lot of people look at it as, is, you know, an antique version of women's basketball. It was so much fun to play. Mm -hmm. It was so exciting. It was high scoring. There was basically no transition because after a made basket, a referee would take the ball out of the, the net and fire it to the other referee at half court. Then you would inbound it at the other offensive end. So basically you're playing half court three on three at each end and nobody crosses half court. So we have three forwards playing offense and three guards playing defense. You get two dribbles. Mm -hmm. And it's just a really fast paced, high scoring game. It's funny because it was originally developed because they didn't think the women had the stamina to run up and down the court like like the man with the five, five player game. But what it created was a, a unique version of our own female game that we just mastered to the point to where we packed the gyms every game. Mm -hmm. And I don't care home away if there was. Sometimes they'd had to have a big gym. If there was four teams in there, it'd be packed because it was just so high scoring and fast paced without that, that transition was so quick and, and, and so we would 
score 100 points a game uh, on a regular basis. I averaged 55 my senior year, scored 70 points or more five times. So we, people find that pretty exciting when you put some points on the board. But it goes back to that fundamentals of how we learned of creating a jump shot off of a dribble or a move or you know you had to be a triple threat you had to be able to drive to the basket you had to be able to pull up for a jump shot and i could shoot i could shoot from long range as well so that was kind of that triple offensive threat and because i learned that in iowa and created that and had that opportunity to shoot 40 times a game in a high school game i don't think a lot of the people when i got outside of iowa and the wpl and the pro leagues were prepared for someone that was that aggressive and can create a shot at any at any time. So but I think what we're seeing a lot uh, with the WNBA, a lot of passing and a perimeter passing going for the three point shot. But mm -hmm. that that creates a lot of openings for someone like Chelsea Gray to make some moves to the hoop and pull up for a shot. Are you more Gray or are you more Kelsey Plum? You know, I'm going back and I'm watching and I'm trying to make a comp uh, in my mind. You tell me, what do you think? Well, I was more of a mid-range player. Mm -hmm. I Even when we got the three-point line, which was the second year of the WBL, it was not considered – the whole mentality of basketball at that time was different because it was not considered a high-percentage shot. Right. And for me to be able to get the amount of shots to score, they had to be good shot selection, or I'd be sat down on the bench just like anybody else if I didn't take a good shot selection. And so that would be considered a high-percentage shot. When you're shooting from the three-point range, which is what a high percentage shot, 30%, mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't acceptable. If I couldn't hit close to 50%, I wasn't going to get a shoot out there. Mm -hmm. So it was all about working the ball in for a higher percentage shot, getting it inside or you know, creating something else. But I think the difference is what I found kind of funny is that um, we used to have practices where the coach would tell us we had to do five passes before we shot. And it seemed like forever, but you see that a lot now, a lot more balanced teams, a lot more teamwork in the WNBA. They work the ball around, they find the weak side and get an open shot where we would, in the WBL, we would have a shot off within the first five seconds, five, 10 seconds, boom. We never had the, th the shot clock expire. It's fat. I mean, it's very much like a seven seconds or less as the Phoenix Suns were running, but in a lot of ways, it almost feels like not a forerunner, but the WNBA is working its way around to where the WBL already was. It was already conquered ground and six on six being, you know, simply a variation of that. Do you think, though, also because you've told me about how, you know, you were not initially getting those star opportunities. You were initially coming off the bench and then playing as well as you did as a young player, you know, showing that instant offense allowed you to you know, eventually become you know, one of the, if not the iconic star of the WBL. Do you think that that happens without the six on six background? I would doubt it because it was such a different style of play and not a lot of people were doing that elevated jump shot off quick moves. And I knew how to move without the ball and how to get open. So when I was overplayed to go back door or come off a double screen. So there was always enough options that if I had one split second, ahead of the defense, I could get a shot off. And mm -hmm. so that was pretty aggressive for time frame. But because of the fact that I had had a lot of experience playing transition full court game and defense, or had been even taught defense, I played two non-consecutive years of college basketball before yeah. I turned pro. And so initially with the WBL, with the Iowa Cornets, they put me on the bench and I got to come in and, and, give it a spark offensively, but I didn't really get a chance to play or get in the flow of the game until about five or six games in the season. And the player that was in my position got injured and I got more time on the court. And as I got more into the flow of the game, I, it all just started coming together. And I remember just one of those early games where we were playing Milwaukee, it was a home game and I scored 38 and one half. So I think that was the point where they decided that I might be valuable for the team. <laughs> yeah, once you get to 38 and a half, it's, it's going to be very difficult for a coach to sit you back down after that. <laughs> when you were watching uh, this WNBA finals as well, and, and I just more generally, I'm just wondering how you balance in your mind pride about knowing 
what you built, what you have helped create for where there is now with, you know, a- any feelings of, you know, wistfulness even over uh-huh. the fact that, you, you know, but for timing, this could have been something that you yourself could have experienced as well. Because I'm, I'm, I mean, we we understand what it would have been like for you to be a part of, you know, let's say an Aces team in 2022. Your game fits perfectly, right? You know, they're at a parade. They're being rightly celebrated. We're we're moving in the direction that we we always should have been. Uh, how do you balance those things? Just in right. you know, I- think about it. Good question, because I think a lot of athletes that come before uh, ahead of their time experience that same thing. Like, what if I could have had that opportunity? Because we were all feeling like we deserve that opportunity. We worked hard. I set goals. I'd always learned that if I set my goals high and worked hard and pursued it, that everything was going to happen. It was all happening and it was getting better and better and better. And then boom, gone. So it was really devastating. And I think a lot of us that were so committed to seeing women's pro basketball succeed, we're just devastated when, when the opportunity just dried up like that. So quickly, there was no closure. So it hurt. So for me, once I picked myself back up and started working hard to try to find another opportunity to get another pro league going, that's what I sort of dedicated myself to for over the next 10 years mm-hmm. is anytime something came up where I could help contribute to women's pro basketball, having another chance, I was there, but it's, it's sort of bittersweet because you love seeing it. And back in 2006, I went to the WNBA 10th anniversary all-star game. Right. And it was at the invitation of Donna Giles Orinder, who played in the WBL, and she was the commissioner of the league. And she invited me back as a VIP. And I remember sitting there at Madison Square Garden at a full house watching the all-star game, just caught between the awe of, wow, look at this. I'm seeing it's really happened. Everything that I visualize and everything that I work for I can see it, but it's not in my time. So it took a generation, I think, of uh, like my generation where we were just hard workers. We were unentitled. We we didn't expect a whole lot, but we just went in there and we loved the game and we fought hard for it. And I think that's really what you need out of these pioneers and these trailblazers is to just unselfishly give to the game and work hard without a lot of return. I know so many of us, myself included, are grateful for it. And I we're going to continue to bring attention to this. Like I said, Molly, this is uh, what I hope will be a continuing conversation. I'm so glad you're here. And obviously, make sure uh, everyone listening uh, that you check out all the work we are doing um, T. Baker's done a fantastic job uh, running a special section on the WBL. Much more to come. Um, I, I, I want to thank all of you for making Locked on Women's Basketball your first listen every day. Uh, now make your second listen, Locked on Fantasy Basketball. Uh, Josh Lloyd hosts the number one daily fantasy basketball show on the planet. It is free and available wherever you get podcasts. Uh, Molly, Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for all you've done and can't wait to talk to you again. Thanks, Howard. Always great to tell the stories. You are locked on women's basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day.